now here, the noon whistle here at Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, where I am. Uh, it's time for me to say this is Steve Larson with uh, Horge Dairyman Magazine. Uh, we welcome all of you to our <coughs> December webinar. We're looking forward to uh, today's uh, presentation on uh, the technology tools that we have to fine-tune our herd care. And, uh, of course, our presenter, Jeffrey uh, Bewley. Uh, we're glad to have you with us today, Jeffrey, and we appreciate the sponsorship today of Kuhn, uh, uh, the company here, uh, actually, another uh, Wisconsin company. Uh, always glad to welcome Mike Hutchins, our co-host as well, down there at the University of Illinois with Jim Baltz, who works along with Mike down there on some of the technical aspects uh, of the webinars. Uh, just another note here that uh, if you do have the ability to print out uh, the handouts, the PowerPoints that are going to be uh, used today, look under the handout section of your menu and you can print those out if you have a, a way to do that and so you can actually follow along uh, in hard copy there if you'd like. So with uh, those opening comments, Mike Hutchins, our co-host down at the University of Illinois, I'm going to turn it over to you and have you introduce our presenter. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It's uh, really a personal and professional honor to introduce this young man, Dr. Jeffrey Buell from uh, Kentucky, where he grew up on a dairy farm, actually his grandfather's a dairy farm, receiving his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Kentucky in 1998, his Master of Science in Dairy Science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2000, and got his Ph.D. from Purdue University in 2008. Uh, Dr. Buley is recognized as one of the world, and I mean that, world authorities in terms of technology applications and uh, ways of measuring uh, t uh, differences in improvement and, and overall dairy management there. Uh, Jeffrey uh, joined the University of Kentucky Animal Science and Food Science Department in 2008, where he is an uh, so assistant associate professor of animal sciences over there. So Dr. Buley, we are very excited and pleased to have you here and turn the program over to you for your program on today's technology tools to fine-tune herd health. Dr. Billy, it's your program. Thank you, Dr. Hutchins, and thank you all for the invitation to present here today. I certainly have always enjoyed Horde's Dairyman since I was a little kid and asked for my first subscription when I was about 10 years old, which was a little bit dorky of me, but my mom seemed to appreciate that and encourage that anyway. I am here today to talk to you about some of the new technologies that are out in the dairy industry now some that are not quite here yet, and to talk about the factors that we need to consider as we think about whether or not to invest in these technologies and as we think about how we can use them successfully and employ them on our farms across the world. First, I'd like to start out by saying that I always want to thank my staff here at the University of Kentucky if I wait till the end, I may forget that, but the students that I work with, our farm staff, they're the ones that, that do all the real work here at the University of Kentucky in this precision dairy technology area, and we wouldn't be able to do or learn anything that we have been able to so far without all of their hard work. If we think about the dairy industry and the technological transformation that's going on right now, I think, first of all, it's important to recognize that in many ways, it's just an extension of other industries. We all have a lot of technology in our lives day to day, from our cars to our cell phones to our computers, and these technology bases have opened up the doors for us to bring in new technologies on the dairy farm. For example, the accelerometer is the base technology for a lot of the wearable technologies that we see on dairy farms today. The accelerometer has become most popular through our cell phones. The accelerometer is what we have in our phones that when we change the orientation of the phone, it changes the orientation of the screen. And it's that same technology that we can then employ in our technologies for cows that gives us things like line time, rumination time, feeding time, and so forth. And it's very cheap technology because what we've been able to do by adopting something that's been adopted largely in another industry. At the same time, we have a lot of new dairy industry demands. 
the things that we have to think about today are not things that my grandfather had to think about 20 years ago as much. We're more concerned about animal well-being. We're more concerned about what the consumers demand of us, the environmental pressures that we put onto our land, the additional labor challenges that we have today, and certainly the economic competition that we have changes the way that we manage and creates this opportunity for these technologies. At the same time, we have a lot of challenges at the cow level. We still have issues finding cows in heat. We have issues finding and treating lame cows, finding and treating cows that have mastitis, catching sick cows in early lactation, and we want to better understand the nutritional status of our cows, whether that be feed intake, body condition, or rumen health. All these factors together create the opportunity for precision dairy technology. When I talk about precision dairy, the part that I'm specifically interested in and will focus on the rest of this talk is precision dairy monitoring. And with precision dairy monitoring, basically we're using technologies to monitor the individual cow. Everything that we're doing is focused on the cow. And in many ways with precision dairy, we are moving back toward the idea of managing the individual cow instead of just managing groups of cows or herds of cows. And what we're doing is we're monitoring parameters, whether that be in the milk, the conformation of the animal, the behavior of the animal, or physiology of the animal, and trying to use technologies to get this new information that can hopefully provide us new insight into how we can manage the animal and identify cows that are deviating from normal that may need some kind of assistance or attention on our part. I look at the cow and I think, what could we measure on that cow? And you can see in, in the image here, there are a lot of different items that we could measure. Many of these things we measure every day. Milk yield, for example. We, we may measure that every day. We are always looking at our cows, trying to, to assess things like locomotion or rumination or feed intake. But many of the items that are listed on that slide, we don't necessarily have the ability to measure regularly in our herds today. Some of them, we may be gaining the ability, and maybe some of the things that I have up there, we don't need to measure. I think that's one of the, the honest truths that we have to consider when it comes to technologies, is just because we can measure something doesn't mean that we necessarily should measure. And certainly, one of the concerns that I have in thinking about all these technologies is that we can get too much information and we could spend a lot of money putting technologies on our cows or in our farm to measure all of these things and the, the economics of that would not dictate that we should do that. So a lot of things that we have to think about yet I think in terms of practical applications, the economics of technology and adoption and the sociology of technology adoption before we consider how this works overall. So at this point, I, we'll, we'll ask one question. Um, we, we're familiar with a lot of the technologies that are out there now measuring things like milk yield or lying time, but there's some newer technologies that are coming out. And my interest is in determining if you could measure some of the items listed on this slide, would you be interested in measuring them? Animal locations, so basically GPS for cows. Respiration rate, trying to assess the cow's response for heat stress or, or identifying uh, respiratory disorders. The mobility or lameness of the cow. Be able to monitor individual animal feed intake or to be able to identify somatic cell count every milking for every animal. Well, the polls are now open here, Steve. Um, I'm going to ask you. I know which one I'm going to vote for. I'm going to lose, but uh, I won't tip my hand. Uh, we've got people voting very quickly here. Uh, Steve, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I wish it's too bad I have to pick just one. I actually think feed intake, if we had to pick one out of that group, uh, might be the one that I would pick. How about you, Mike? I'm going to pick a loser, I'm sure. I'm going to pick mobility and lameness. I, I think it's such a huge problem on a lot of farms that not it's not recognized. I, I, I'm i pretty sure I'm going to lose here. In fact, we've got 70% of the vote in, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here. Uh, Steve, any last comment before we close the poll? Well, let's see what they have to say out there. 
Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I close the poll, and I'm going to share it now. And uh, Dr. Buley, what, what, are you surprised with the answers that we have on the screen? I'll let you talk about them. I'm definitely not surprised that feed intake is number one. Um, me, I've often referred to feed intake as the holy grail of measurements. If, if we could monitor feed intake directly, that that could be extremely useful for us in, in managing the operation. Not terribly surprised that mobility is second. I think it's it's really an important issue. Um, probably our the fact that we don't recognize how important of it as an industry is probably part of the reason why it shows up a little bit lower. Um, perhaps a little bit surprised that that probably only one or two people were interested in in respiration rate. I think there could be some really interesting applications for respiration rate, particularly with regards to heat stress, and and. Not a little bit surprised that nobody's interested in tracking animal behavior. We'll talk a little bit about how that might be useful a bit later in the webinar. So uh, very interesting results and, and uh, I, I think really tells us a lot about what people think and uh, I can tend to agree with the value of feed intake. Okay, so in a general sense, one of the questions is, can we get happy cows through technology? If we use technologies that might be monitoring the animal behavior, the animal physiology, looking at something in the milk, or using image analysis, which I think is, is going to be a huge area for moving forward, for measuring parameters on the individual animals over time. And you can see the cow there with the happy face on her teeth. That's a real cow at the University of Kentucky Dairy. That's what happens when you start using technologies on your cows. What are the potential benefits of precision dairy monitoring technology? First of all, to me, the biggest one is I think that these technologies give us tremendous potential for improving animal health and animal well-being. I think they provide us opportunities for earlier detection of animals that need attention, earlier detection of cows that have some kind of, of disease or illness, I think they can help us improve efficiency on our farms. They can help us improve product quality, minimize the environmental impact of our dairy farms, and they can provide us with more objective measures of things that we've typically measured subjectively. For example, I think about body condition score. And it's very easy if I'm a farmer to look at a cow and say, okay, she's a little bit thin, but the reason she's thin is because she's had twins and she's had a retained placenta and milk fever. So you bump her up a little bit. You give her an, an excuse for being lower than what for lower than what she should be. Or if I'm a farmer that has a cow that's a little bit too heavy, I might say that's a cow that I had trouble getting bred. So she's a little bit long in lactation, therefore she's fat. So I'm going to forgive her for that, and I'm going to lower her score a little bit. And that's kind of defeating the purpose of the scales to some degree because it's not the reasons why. It's that they're there that we're interested in. So with a technology, for example, if we can objectively measure body condition score, then we could better measure that to determine how we could use that information without putting a human bias into the equation. And I think we have other things like locomotion scoring or hygiene scoring that we could then bring in and add to that list of possibilities for measuring things objectively that we've typically done subjectively. When I think about early disease detection, I think it's really easy to familiarize yourself and think about how it might help us to treat animals sooner, help us improve our prevention program, and hopefully these would help us to improve our treatment outcome, reduce our production and economic losses, and improve animal well-being. I also think that it's important to state here that although it's intuitive to think about we might be able to have improved disease control we're able to detect diseases earlier, there isn't actually a lot of data showing that this is really the case. So if we're going to try to quantify this, it's difficult to assess how much value that would be. And I think the other thing that we really have to think hard about here is if we use technologies to detect animals with disease, we really run the risk of over-treating. And certainly we don't want to over-treat animals. Uh, more concerns about resistance to antibiotics and certainly the cost involved with treating cows would hopefully temper that to some degree. But there are times when we may have a cow that's showing some signs of sickness 
that the best thing that we should do is let her go for another day. Let her go, let her body take care of the system and try to improve over time. So we have to do this with some caution about not over-treating our animals. There are a lot of different potential application areas for precision dairy monitoring. Asterisk detection is probably the one that everybody's the most familiar with. There are a lot of options on the market now for asterisk detection. And asterisk detection, these technologies really work well. They help us to identify cows that are in heat. Potential for using technologies for mastitis detection, for fresh cow disease detection, helping us identify that cow that's getting ready to have milk fever, a DA, or ketosis, so that we can intervene and help that animal helping us to identify lame cows, helping us to identify when cows are going to calve. And I think an, a less talked about area is being able to monitor things continuously and add them to our genetic evaluation. So, for example, again, if we're looking at body condition score or locomotion score, and we're able to measure that continuously, then we have a better phenotype to be able to bring into our genetic evaluations that would hopefully enable us to be able to start selecting for the types of body condition score curves and resistance to lameness that we would like to see in our herds. And then I think that there are also quite a few opportunities for management monitoring at the herd level. So if we're able to monitor these, these animals, we might be able to tell that a group of animals is not lying down as much as what we'd like for them to, or that a group of animals have too low of a rumen pH. So we can use these inf this information to perhaps change the way we feed our cows, change the way we house our cows, and that provides us a lot of opportunity at the herd level. The number of technologies that are already out there today is absolutely amazing to me. This area has really taken off in the last five or six years. We've seen technology after technology come onto the market. Everybody sees them as they pick up your dairy magazines, as you search through the internet. It's easy to see how many technologies that are out there. Um, being in this area in a research setting, I see a lot of other technologies that are coming about. There's some exciting things that are out there already and more exciting things coming down the pipeline. And I think when I consider this from a dairy producer's perspective, I get really overwhelmed really quickly. If I'm a dairy producer and I've followed this area from the outside looking in and I see all of these technologies that are coming about and I think I might want to invest in a technology, it's a really difficult question to answer of which one should I invest in. I think that it very much depends on the particular farm. If a farm is, is wanting to look for some help with estrus detection or reproductive management, maybe that makes the most sense. If somebody has more issues with mastitis management, maybe we should look more towards some of the melt parameters. If somebody has more uh, lameness issues, maybe some of the activity monitors can help us. But it, it is very much farm dependent. Let's take a look now at some examples of some of the technologies that are out there. So let's start in our milking parlor, for example. We see a number of different technologies that are just now coming out for monitoring somatic cell count in line. So we see four examples there, the Mastiline, Lely, De Laval, and CellSense technologies that measure somatic cell count in some fashion or another in line to where we can get an individual somatic cell count for every animal, every milking. Essentially what we have then is a daily hot sheet. We know which cows are contributing the most cells to the tank each day. We can look for deviations and identify cows that are starting to become infected earlier. Uh, really, I think, could be a very powerful tool for helping us manage mastitis. However, this is also one of those areas where I think we have to be cautious because we may have a cow, for example, that spikes really high for a day or two or a milking or two and then goes back down to normal. And our tendency would be to treat that animal. However, if a cow only goes up for a milking or two and then she returns back to normal, isn't that what we wanted her to do anyway? The cow's best defense is her own body. So if we're able to take that, that technology and we overreact, again, we could overtreat that cow. I think maybe a better 
reaction instead of treating would be to take a milk sample from that animal when we first see an alert so that we can culture her so that if she does break with our normal clinical signs, then we would be better enabled to determine what we should treat her with. So we have to be careful in overreacting to somatic cell count. There are a few different technologies out there that use spectroscopy. Basically, they're looking at the patterns of light flowing through the milk. And these provide us some indirect identifications of changes in milk composition. This could be fat percentage, protein percentage, lactose percentage. There are a lot of other things that are coming out. The neat thing about this particular technology, the one that we see in the picture here is the AFI lab, is that there are no variable costs associated with using it. There's, well, there's no kind of reagent that runs through that. It's all based on patterns of light flowing through the milk. So it, it's very easy to maintain, and there are not upkeep costs associated with using that particular technology. Then we look at a technology like the DeLaval Herd Navigator, which really, to me, is, is an exciting opportunity for us. It's not available here in the US yet, but should be relatively soon. It is available in Canada and Europe. But this technology provides us measurements of multiple parameters within the milk. It provides this data real time. First of all, it's measuring progesterone. What a powerful tool to be able to measure progesterone in the milk to be able to help manage reproduction. It helps us with heat detection, pregnancy detection, identifying cows that aren't cycling, uh, even some abortion detection potential with progesterone. It's really moving away from indirect measures of estrus, for example, through activity to a direct measure of what's actually going on physiologically with that animal. Then we have the LDH enzyme, which is an early mastitis detection potential, measuring BHPA as an indicator of subclinical ketosis. I've been to a couple of herds in Denmark that were actually using this within a robotic milking system, and they were delivering propylene glycol automatically in a feedback loop to the animals that had a, a high BHBA level. And then uh, urea status also is the final measure that this particular technology would provide. Then we look at the wearable technologies. It's really easy to look at the wearable technologies and make an analogy to what's going on in human health. A lot of people use Fitbits or similar technologies to monitor activity, and that also uses an accelerometer base. Well, all these wearable technologies for our cows are basically Fitbit for cows. That's what we talk to people about when we're talking to people outside of, of the dairy industry about what we do. But we have a number of different technologies that are held on the ear or around the neck of the cow that measure feeding time, rumination time, neck activity, grazing time, a number of different things that we can measure automatically with these technologies. And at first, when I heard about this idea, I was very, very skeptical. I thought, how could it be that we could put a tag on the neck or the ear, and it would provide us that kind of information? But if you watch cows, which I enjoy doing, then you can watch there is a very rhythmic motion that occurs with both feeding and rumination. And it's picking up that pattern of motion. And we validated some of these technologies, and they really do a nice job of identifying these behaviors. Then we could look at measuring something physiologically in the animal. So a few different technologies that we have here, a number of technologies trying to measure temperature. Technologies, for example, that measure rumen temperature. The challenge with rumen temperature, of course, is every time a cow drinks water, there's a dramatic decrease in temperature within the rumen. Trying to figure out how to work that out can be a little bit of a challenge, although indirectly that might help us to identify how much water the cow's drinking. We have technologies that measure ear temperature. Uh, challenge with, with some of these maybe is, is they have a probe that goes into the ear canal and keeping that in the ear over time. Vaginal temperature is a really good temperature. However, we are limited in how long we can keep the, the vaginal temperature in device in the animal. Room and pH, uh, I think a lot of excitement from nutritionists about the potential for monitoring room and pH. The limitation right now with ruin pH is primarily cost. A lot of these technologies are, are a bit costly to apply on farm today. And then also, I still have some questions about drift of pH. If we were doing pH in the laboratory, we would be continuously uh, calibrating our pH meter. And if, if we had this in an animal, 
we're not able to continuously calibrate that. We've been working with some of these, though, recently and really been excited about what we've been able to find with these room and pH monitors. And then a little bit further out, but you see the cow with the technology on her leg. That's a technology that measures respiration rate, heart rate, and blood pressure, telling us a little bit more about what's going on physiologically with that animal. We also have a, quite a few technologies out there now for measuring line behavior. I think line behavior can really help us to identify cows that need attention, cows that are becoming lame, cows that are becoming sick, or cows that are in heat. I think these can be a great tool for assessing facility function, for assessing cow comfort, and for looking at animal well-being. I think we have to be careful about how we interpret some of this information. We hear a lot about how many hours a day that our cows are required to lie. Uh, and then we get into situations where maybe it doesn't quite look like what we expect. Uh, and we have to recognize that, that our fresh cows in particular really have to spend a lot of time at the bunk. And we may not see as high of line times in our fresh cows as what we would like to see, which only drives home the point that we really need to provide all of our animals ample opportunity to lie down, good cow comfort. And that's particularly the case for our fresh cow. We need to provide our fresh cows all the opportunity they can have to lie down because of how important that behavior is to them. Now, although it didn't show up as, as an interesting point to people in the poll earlier, I think these real-time location systems can provide us some interesting information. These are basically GPS systems for cows. They're not really GPS because you can't use GPS within a barn, but they use something called triangulation, basically identifying the strength of signal from the cow to particular reading points throughout the barn. I think this information can really help us in identifying changes in behavior that might help us to identify sick cows or cows that are in heat. And then the other thing that I'm really interested in with these technologies is using them to monitor cow behavior, cow response to the environment, so that we can design better facilities, better able to meet what the cow actually needs. I really think these technologies have a whole lot of potential for showing us some really new, valuable information for facility design. There are also quite a few technologies out there now for calving detection. Some of these technologies are vaginal devices that measure vaginal temperature. There is a dramatic decrease in vaginal temperature that occurs about 24 to 48 hours before calving. So basically, with these systems, you would get an alert saying this cow is going to calve within 24 to 48 hours, and then the way a lot of these work is when that device then is expelled from the animal as the cow is calving, there's a dramatic change in temperature again, identifying the calving process has started. And then there are a couple of other technologies that are tail-based. So you basically put this around the tail, kind of like a wristwatch, and that's using an accelerometer, basically just looking for the changes in tail behavior. So as the cow's raising her tail more, then that can provide us some valuable information about an impending calving. We've done a lot of work here at the University of Kentucky with these technologies. Uh, I think that we've done quite a bit just looking at, at how we can use some of the existing technologies. You see one of our cows here that has technologies all around her trying to assess the comparisons of how some of these technologies might help us identify estrus lameness, fresh cow disease, and mastitis. But we've also focused some on developing some new technologies. So one of the, the projects that we've been doing that, that I've been working with Anthony Shelley and, and Daniel Lau here in our engineering department is trying to identify body condition scores. So basically, we're using 3D images using the same basic camera that's in the, the Xbox to identify changes in the conformation of the animal for identifying body condition. We've also done a study looking at potential for using image analysis for feed intake. So basically just looking at the disappearance of feed and measuring the contour of the feed in front of an animal to identify how much the cow has been eating. So our proof of concept work showed that we were able to do this very well in a fairly controlled environment and now we're looking to move that forward, uh, see how we can do that in an actual live bunk situation. We've also been developing a monitor for sleep. We think sleep could be important for immune function, uh, for identifying animal well-being, diseases, and helping for us to determine what goes on in the facility. Uh, we can do a lot with line time for monitoring rest quantity, but that doesn't do anything for rest quality. So we've been trying to develop a monitor for assessing sleep 
And again, our proof of concept work showed that we were able to identify when the cow was sleeping fairly well. All of this brings us a tremendous amount of data. I really love this phrase by Edward Stimming, who was the father of total quality management, but he said, in God we trust, all others bring data. This whole area of big data, it's a hot word right now, but basically what big data is, is using data sets that are so large or complex that traditional data processing, processing applications are not adequate. We need to move toward things like neural networks and random forests, some really fascinating ways of, of looking at data. Uh, lots of, of challenges with how we analyze, capture, search, store, and visualize this data. And I think it's interesting to think about how much data we have on the farm and recognize that across the world, 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. We're creating more and more data and trying to figure out how we can use this data. When I think about a technology, what are the things that we want to look for in a technology? Here's the things that I look for in a technology. First of all, I think the technology has to explain an underlying biological process. It has to provide us with useful information about something that's going on within that animal. It has to be something that we can translate to meaningful action. Just because we can measure something doesn't necessarily mean we can do something about that. If we're going to use heart rate for identifying that a cow's getting ready to have a heart attack, I'm not sure we can do that much about it at the time. So maybe that's not a useful application. These technologies have to be cost effective. That doesn't necessarily mean low cost, but it has to be something that we can show an economic return for our investment. The technologies have to be flexible, they have to be robust, and they have to be reliable. It's a very difficult environment that we ask, ask these technologies to survive in. So we need them to be able to handle the wet, dirty conditions with the clumsy animals that we put these technologies on. I think the technologies in the end have to be simple and they have to be solution focused. Too many times I see a new technology come about that's an engineering feat that's looking for a solution rather than, a te rather than the opposite. The technology has to provide us information in a readily available format. Dairy producers it's a general rule, don't have the time or the interest in pouring through graph after graph after graph of raw data. We have to sort that out in a format that makes it a little bit easier to use. The economics are extremely important. We need to do some investment analysis. We have to recognize that these technologies are not a one-size-fits-all situation. What makes economic sense for one farm may not necessarily make economic sense for another. It's most easy to show the economic benefits for heat detection and reproduction. We've developed a tool for investment analysis of heat detection technologies. This was some work from Carmel, Carmela Dolacek, one of my graduate students here at the University of Kentucky. So this is a dashboard that's available online where HERD can go in and put their specific HERD information with what they see as some of the alternatives for estrus detection and then it would provide them a net present value analysis for the profitability of investment in that technology. Although we, we think about quantifying the economic benefits of technology, there are some intangible values that are a little bit harder to quantify. This is a farm that, that we work with on one of our research projects. The, the barn that you see here was a barn that struggled a little bit with heat stress. We were out there earlier this summer and they had just installed this temperature monitoring system and somebody made a comment that these cows in this particular barn looked hotter than other barns and the farmer said, you know, now that you say that, I think that, that those cows have been higher on our new temperature monitoring technology. And then I, I looked to see, to see what the issues could be. I happened to have my handy device that you can attach to your cell phone to get wind speed. I went into the barn, identified that there was one area of the barn that didn't have enough fans, and then identified that there was a ridge opening that was completely closed that needed to be opened. This farm has had this issue for a few years. It had been brought up before, but until they had data, they didn't see that it was really an issue. And the next week, the farmer texted me the picture that you see here where he had opened the ridge and added the fan. So there's a value to that kind of information that's a bit harder to actually quantify. I really like this, this diagram that shows how we go through 
product life cycles. Uh, we start out with a technology trigger. This is when we see the, the new uh, ad in the magazine shows the new technologies out there. We get really excited about the technology, what it could do for us, and we enter this period of inflated expectations. Maybe we have the bar set a little bit too high with what we might be able to do with the technology. Then we start to figure out it really can't do all of that. So we enter the trough of disillusionment, which is where most of my graduate students spend their time. And then we start to learn what we really can do. We enter the slope of enlightenment. And finally, we end up in a productive period. So for me, I think when we look at these technologies overall with estrus detection, I think we've been through every stage of that. And we're now in the plateau of productivity. We know what we can do. We know what we can't do with estrus detection technologies. However, on the other side, I think with health detection technologies, I think we're largely still in the peak of inflated expectations. I think maybe we have our goal set a little bit too high with what we might be able to gain out of these technologies. Sometimes these, mark, these technologies are marketed as, as plug and play, but maybe sometimes it may seem more like they're plug and pray or plug and pay. We have challenges with integrating the data. You go into the University of Kentucky Dairy Manager office, you will find eight different computers. All these technologies have to sit on different computers. They don't communicate with each other. They don't necessarily tie in too well to our management software. So it's a real challenge and a real limitation for us is integrating data from multiple sources. And this is going to continue to be a bottleneck for us until we can start finding ways that we can integrate this data. I also think we have to recognize that we can really be snowed over by looking at one individual graph. So it's very easy for me as a researcher or a company marketing and technology to pull out a graph and say, look at this, here's a cow that was going along, and then suddenly her, her line time increased dramatically, and then we identified that she had E. coli mastitis. And then after we treated it, it got better. So you get excited, you say, yeah, that makes sense, that's exciting, I can do that, let me buy your technology. But the, that's not the whole story, because I can pull this one, and then I can also find a cow that doesn't respond at all, or find a cow that has that, that doesn't have any issue. So we really, really have to think about sensitivity and specificity. We have to think about how these pieces of information can be useful for us. Let's walk through a couple of examples. If we have 100 estrus events, and the technology identifies 80 of them, but misses 20, that's what we would call 80% sensitivity. So the question I have there is, is that good enough if it only picks up 80%? Then if we look at, if we have 100 alerts for asterisks, and the technology, the, well, of those 100, 90 of them are for cows that are actually in heat, and 10 for cows that are not in heat, is that good enough? That's a 10% false positive rate or 90% specificity. I can make either of these numbers 100% for any technology we work with just by changing the threshold. However, the two are always fighting each against each other. We have to think about a balance between the two, a balance between the sensitivity and the specificity. We have to be careful about how accurate the alerts are versus how many false positives we get. So that brings us to our next poll question, basically saying for disease detection, what percent of alerts that are true false positives would you view as acceptable? So 1% would say 99% of the time the alerts are right and 1% they're wrong and so on for 5, 10, 25, and 50%. Okay, Mike, what do you think there? I'm trying to... Well, I, uh, I'm going to go for 10% for, for no particular scientific reason, just knowing that nothing is perfect, but I'd like to have them be right 90% of the time. You know, I, I'm guessing, Steve, and we'll see what Jeff, uh, Dr. Buley wants to say, Jeffrey, uh, you know, it, it may make a difference, you know, if it's mastitis versus reproduction, you know, uh -huh. that percent may be, a, so I'm, I'm going to go to 5%, uh, you know, okay. the significance, you know, if you look at publishing data in the Journal of Dairy Science, uh, uh, the P less, uh, P.05 means it's it's real, and uh, and your number would be a trend. That's okay, Steve, I know you're not a scientist there, you went to, the, you went to Kansas State, but anyway, just uh, a little kind of see where this is going. We got about 61% of the board in. Okay, interesting to see the response and it'll be interesting to see what Jeffrey has to say about that. 
Okay, Republicans, let's finish up here. Come on. We must have got a lot of Republicans 61%. on the line, Steve, because we're sitting at 61%. It must be yeah. the Donald effect. That's all I can figure uh, out. Confusion. Uh, just confusion. Can you trump yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, darn. All okay, right. I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close the poll. I'm in charge of this. I'm at 64 percent. Not enough Chicago people here. Close the poll. Share the results. And uh, okay. Jeff, what do you see here, Jeffrey? Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. I, I think that what's listed there, um, five percent, 54 percent say that, that that's what they would prefer. 32 percent at 10, and 44 percent at 25 percent. Um, to me, I, I would really like to see either the one percent or five percent uh, that's probably asking a little bit much right now but the challenge that we have if, if we go to that ten percent rate that means if we have a thousand alerts one hundred of them are wrong and and that's a lot of animals to be chasing whether we have to go do a physically physical exam or, or whether we end up treating those animals uh, can really be a challenge for us for a health detection perspective for asterisk detection ten percent doesn't sound so bad to me uh, it very much depends on on the condition that we're looking at. It depends on on the risk level that that farm is willing to accept. But I, I think uh, it's interesting. Probably not not so far from what I would expect. But a really good question that we have to start thinking about with regards to these technologies for how we can actually use them on farm. We also have to think about how we're going to handle this data. If we have an alert, are we going to examine the animal, treat her, no treat? What are we going to do with those decisions? What are we going to do to establish a protocol for handling the, handling the alert? How do we react to these cows that are just natural reactions of healthy cows? What do we do with repeat alerts where the same cow shows up over and over every day on the same alert list? What do we do about failed devices? No matter what, we're going to have some devices that don't work. And then what's our backup plan for a system outage? There are certainly going to be times when the system goes down. And if we're relying on this system as our primary means of catching cows with a particular issue or catching cows in heat, what are we going to do if the system goes down? Probably one of the most important lessons that I've learned over time in working with these technologies is from my friend David Corbin. David's a dairy producer here in Kentucky who has been a little bit technology challenged. This is uh, as relaxed as you'll see David. David's talking on his cell phone. I know what he's talking about. He's talking about cows because I've been on the other end of that. He's got his horse there in his lap and he's got his boots on with manure on his jeans. This guy lives cows. He is the classic dairy producer that loves his cows. And he really understands cow behavior. A couple years ago we set out to do a project and the company that we were working with for the project said you don't want this guy on your on your study because He's not going to be able to figure out the technology. However, at the end of that, he is super user for the technology because David is ever able to use all of that cow knowledge that he has and apply it to the technology data. So the lesson here is that when we think about these technologies, it's cow people that are going to benefit the most. If somebody's looking for an easy way out or something that maybe isn't a it's already a management problem. The technology isn't going to get them there. It's the cow people that are really going to benefit the most. Some simple oversight that we've seen. First of all, I think we need to re realize that heat detection systems only catch cows that are in heat. Comparing ourselves to a synchronization protocol, that's a little bit of a challenge because a synchronization pro protocol helps cows that aren't cycling. When a system picks up a sick cow, she's still a sick cow. We, we, we act like maybe sometimes that the technology detecting disease is going to solve our problems, but we've still got the problem. So we have to be careful not to put ourselves into a purely treatment mode, and we still need to focus on prevention. We don't do anything with the information. It was absolutely useless, and sometimes we're the guinea pigs with some of these technologies. Some practical lessons that we've learned at the University of Kentucky. Raccoons here love the taste of Cat5 cable. Our raccoons have messed up so many data points in our studies. They eat technologies, they chew through cable, they move technologies, and rodents can be a real limitation for technology. And lightning. Lightning will strike the same technology twice. These will knock your system out for days at a time, and that creates a real challenge when you're trying to, trying to rely on that technology for management. When I'm 
thinking about what I would ask if I were a dairy producer looking for a technology, here's the things I would ask. First of all, what's the sensitivity and specificity for the condition of interest? If I get 95% sensitivity, 99% specificity on estrus detection, do I get 80% and 80% for disease detection? These are questions that we really need to be asking. In some of our research, we've shown nice data set with 51% sensitivity, 51% specificity. That's an expensive coin toss. We have to really ask ourselves if it provides us a useful alert. What percent of the devices fail in a year? <clears throat> if we see 2-3% of our devices fail in a year, that's probably normal and acceptable. However, we see some of our technologies where it's 30 or 40% of the devices that fail in a year and that can be a real challenge. What's the warranty policy when you do have something like a device that fails or a lightning strike? What's the policy for upgrading to new versions of devices? All these technologies are continually improving and if you're using the same technology today that you're using 10 years from now, you're probably using a very outdated technology. We have to think about that plan for upgrading to the new technology. We have to make sure we capture all the full cost the hardware, the devices, the maintenance, and any data stored costs. And then, of course, I think it's important to talk to existing users of the technology to see how they're making it work on their farm. Customer service is absolutely critical. I think it's more important than the actual gadget. People working on dairy farms aren't necessarily computer jocks and not necessarily engineers. We have to have people that are able to help us learn how to use the technology and help us to solve problems when it's not working. Where are we going looking forward? I think we're going to continue to see more sensor systems. We're going to continue to see more wearable devices, but I think in time we'll see more milk-based technologies and more image-based technology. There are so many parameters that we have potential for measuring in the milk that can help us identify things going on with the animal and looking at image analysis, being able to identify body condition, locomotion, hygiene. Uh, I'm really excited about the potential for using images for evaluating our animals. I think over time we'll see a shift from the reproduction and health technologies more toward well-being and environmental impact technologies. We'll see more multi-parameter systems. It's not going to be enough that a technology measures one thing. We're going to want to measure measure three or four things with the same technology. We'll see more machine learning techniques for using the data, uh, neural networks, fuzzy logic, these sort of things that are beyond just looking at a, a standard control chart looking for deviations from the, the average. I think we'll move toward a point where we see individual farm algorithms. So what the, the, the alert level is for one farm isn't the same as what it is for another farm. I think it's, it's a little bit of a broad assumption to assume that all farms are the same. We'll see more data that goes into the cloud. User groups, groups that are getting together to talk about how they can use the information so they can share their knowledge at the farm level about what they've found and learned from the technologies. More open source hardware, things like the Raspberry Pi that will completely change the dynamics of how some of these technology works. I think over time, producers will ask for higher quality alerts and hopefully our purchase decisions will be more than just gut feel. We'll actually do some investment analysis for looking into these technologies. We have a lot of big data coming at us. It provides us a lot of exciting opportunities. I'm really excited about what we're able to do with these technologies now, but more excited about what we're going to be able to do about them moving forward. But we have to maintain realistic expectations. We have to realize the confines of the cow, of the people, of the economics of these technologies, and if we do that, I think we can be very pleased with what we see from these technologies. If you're interested in, in learning more about this area, uh, you, can, uh, you can identify and look at our uh, Precision Patty. She has a Facebook page, she has a Twitter page, and that she's constantly po pointing out information about Precision Dairy area, and she's blue and white the way that we really would like our cows to be. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today.
Well, Jeffrey, thank you very much. That was an exciting, fast uh, go through. Uh, Steve, do you want to uh, do uh, some some uh, housekeeping uh, items at this point? Yeah, uh, I, I do. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for a very uh, interesting and stimulating <laughs> uh, presentation. Get, you've given us lots to think about, lots of very practical considerations too. Uh, I might add and. Uh, and pretty understandable from a guy here that doesn't know the difference between Bluetooth and Blu-ray. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate your uh, using uh, terms for the most part that uh, we can all identify with and, uh, and then see as part of our future. So we really do appreciate you for your nice job. And again, our thanks to, to Kuhn for the sponsorship of today's presentation. Just a few things, those of you that are with us before, and there were a lot of you out there today. We had well over 100 of you uh, with us at, at times, uh, and uh, we appreciate that. You'll be getting a survey, a very brief survey here in a couple of days uh, to, uh, that will enable you to give your response to uh, today's webinar, and we really do appreciate your uh, cooperation and participation in that. Uh, and we. Uh, want to remind you that uh, this presentation and all of our previous webinars are available uh, uh, on our archives, um, uh, just going by going to hordes.com and checking on, clicking on the uh, webinar uh, section of our homepage. You will be able to find all of those uh, from the past as well as this one in just a few days. Um, then looking ahead uh, to next month, uh, Mike Hutchins will be our presenter in January. I believe that's January 11th, right? And he's going to be bringing us an update on feed additives, probiotics, yeast, niacin, things of that nature. Lullaman uh, Animal Nutrition is going to be uh, sponsoring that. So with those comments, uh, Mike, do we have some questions? And before, let me just ask one of... Uh, Jeffrey, before I turn this back to you to, to lead us through some of these questions, uh, Jeffrey, what about approval of these? Uh, I guess I'm thinking especially of those that uh, measure milk volume uh, and our components. Uh, uh, they need to be approved for use in our records keeping systems here. Uh, you might just re bring us up to date on what kind of steps uh, that, those, that approval uh, uh, or certification involves, and uh, uh, then uh, we can proceed with the other questions. For, for milk weights, the to be an official milk weight, it has to be ICAR approved. That's the International Committee on Animal Recording. So there's a um, standard standard protocol for um, how we can identify milk recording, and some of the technologies that are out there are not ICAR approved. And maybe that's that's okay to some degree. Um, for the technologies, anything that actually takes a milk sample, that has to go through the pasteurized milk ordinance. So that can be a bit of a challenge for some of these technologies. It's going through the, the process of, of going through the acceptance for the pasteurized milk ordinance here in the United States. Um, so that is, that is a concern and, and can be a limitation. I think one of the other things that we have to think about in the, in the broader term is that as we get the ability to measure things like milk yield, milk fat, milk protein, milk cell count in line, how does that fit within DHI? I think we'll see more producers, if they have these systems, make the decision that they no longer need to be a part of DHI, at least as it currently stands, and that creates some, some challenges for us, I think, at the industry level, and I think DHI has a, has a, lot, of, um, a lot of need to start looking at how they can integrate these technologies into what they do to maintain their presence on the farm. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Now, one thing, could you advance one more slide, and then we'll let Mike uh, come up with some, some other uh, inquiries. There we go. Thanks. Yeah, that's very important, uh, Steve. As, as you and I both know, without our great sponsors, uh, these aren't going to happen as far as that goes. So, Keon, we want to, as, uh, as Steve already has identified, we want to thank you very much for your willingness to sponsor this, this webinar. Yes, we have questions. Jeff, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey, are you ready to rock and roll here? I'm ready. Uh, would, uh, would you please give us a little more information about the 3D imaging techniques for dry matter measurements? So basically, the, it's like looking at a contour of a map. You have a pile of feed in front of the animal, and 
the it's a 3D image that's that's identifying the shape of that, and so you have one shape that occurs before the animal approaches the bunk, and then the shape of the feet in front of her changes after she leaves, after she's eaten. So that difference would be identifying the amount of feed that that animal has consumed. Uh, Jeffrey, would that mean uh, that that, per that animal only had access to that mound of feed there, as much like some of the uh, individual feeding stalls we see at research facilities? Or could I do that on a feed bunk? In other words, if a, you know, a cow comes into the bunk, uh, can I do it on the fly? That, right now, what we've done has been basically in a tie stall barn. So that, because we have to control that first. But we have some ideas for how we might be able to do that in a normal bunk situation. Um, and I, I think that that's where we would need to go eventually. But certainly, if you have to have an individual stall for each animal, that's not very practical on a commercial level. We need to get to where we can apply that in a, in a normal bunk situation. Dr. Buley, have you looked at eating time? In other words, that's something you can measure. Say, if this cow spends uh, 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 one hour a day eating, another cow an hour and ten minutes, will she then have more dry matter intake because she spends ten more minutes of eating time? That can be separated from uh, cud chewing time, can it not? We can get eating time separate from rumination time. We haven't tied that into the dry matter intake yet, but certainly it, it's not a... It's not a 0.8 correlation or anything like that. The, the relationship is somewhat loose there because different cows eat at different speeds and, and meal size and so forth. So all that factors in. Feeding time, I think, can be a very useful parameter, but we have to recognize it's not really getting that at necessarily feed intake. Another interesting question about monitoring how many cows. Uh, do we need to monitor all cows for everything, or could we monitor a percent like 2% or 10% or a third, like we see on, on some of uh, the uh, uh, some of the, the vet school guidelines when they do like uh, uh, measuring uh, rumen synthesis? Any thoughts on representative size of sample, or do we have to measure them all? I think it depends on the the application. So. If we're looking for something for disease detection, maybe we need to look at all the animals, although we could also say we don't need to look at all the animals. Maybe we only need to look in the first 60 days of lactation. That's our most critical period of time. Um, for asterisk detection, we could focus just on the breeding period. For something like ruin pH, I think the idea of having a percentage of the herd, I don't know what percentage that is at this point, but maybe only five or ten percent of the animals need a bolus in them to identify their pH because that's something that really we're trying to me measure at the herd level as opposed to the individual cow animal or instead of the individual cow level. But I think it depends a little bit on the application. Um, one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of the image-based and milk-based technologies and, and why I think we'll see a shift in that direction is because you can have a base technology that you have a fixed cost that you spread over a lot of animals as opposed to the wearable technologies where you have to have one on every animal. An interesting question here is and on your six technology questions, where do I find the answers? Like, should a company be able to give me, if I ask them specificity and sensitivity analysis and percent of device fails per year, or do I have to go to you? Or where do I find those answers? That's a great question. Um, I think in many, many ways right now they're they're lacking to some degree. I think as an industry we need to be asking that question because from a practical perspective, and this is something that we see in, in, in the herds that we work with and, and that I hear as I go around the world talking about these technologies, is if, if I have, for example, a, a 300 cow herd and I have 50 cows show up on my alert list every day, eventually I'm going to stop looking at my alerts because I know that I don't have 50 cows that have problems. Or if that's a 1,000 cow herd and it's 200 animals. So we have to start demanding a little bit higher level of performance of, of those um, alerts so that we can get to that point. But I think many times they're not really there right now on the health detection. I think if you look, you can find a lot of those numbers on asterisk detection. Um, the asterisk detection technologies are definitely ahead of the health detection technologies. And it, and it makes sense that they are because it's a, it's a very dramatic change in behavior or physiology over a very short period of time. And disease is complicated because it occurs across time. There's a pattern that may occur. And also we have the complexity of, of having clinical and subclinical disease and transitioning back and forth between that. And I think 
many times the reason why people are dis disappointed in some of the health alerts is because they look and physically that cow doesn't have clinical disease, but if we were to go in and, and measure and look at something like BHVA level or calcium level, we'd find that she does have subclinical ketosis or subclinical milk fever and that really we did, did need to intervene on that particular cow. Uh, from Belgium, a question, how do you feel about uh, data dumps? Maybe you better define what data dumps are, because uh, I'm not quite sure I know what that would be. I, I don't know what a data dump is either. Okay, I guess we'll, we'll move on. Um, I think, I, I know this answer, I'll let you answer it, it's there. What is behind your name, you had PAS, what does that stand for? Is that a degree? It's not a degree, it's a certification, of professional animal scientist. It's something that we have here to uh, maintain continuing education and maintain a standard for how we perform as animal scientists. Here's a kind of point of question. How accurate is deal valve system for heat detection and heat stress cows? Do you want to make a comment on that or in general? Um, the progesterone data for, for heat detection for the herd navigator looks looks pretty good. I'm not familiar with, with work that they've done on, on heat stress in that regard. One of the things I didn't mention that, that I think is interesting with heat stress is that with some of these technologies, I think we'll be able to go from turning our fans and sprinklers and so forth on based on outside conditions to going where we can actually listen to what the cow is telling us. So we have a feedback loop that says the cow's body temperatures are shifting, so now let's turn our, our sprinklers or our fans on instead of the outside temperature. And I think that's going to help us manage heat stress better. A neat question. Are, are more of these technologies being geared towards uh, freestall situations or tie stall versus tie stall barns? Uh, where, where do you see this going in the future? I think most of them are geared toward a freestall situation. Um, that's that's where most of the the industry is around the world, at least for for confined systems. And and I think most of them would apply more there. Although a lot of the technologies would have benefits in tie stall barns also. The other thing, of course, we have to think about is is pasture based systems. And uh, we've been working with some of the groups in in New Zealand and Australia, and they've got some pretty neat ideas for how we can use technologies for measuring. Um, possibly grazing time and and looking at how they can use sort of virtual fencing and that sort of thing. Our Belgium colleague came back and said by data dumps uh, she means that data is put in a text file and can be used by the farmer like an Excel spreadsheet maybe even manipulation uh, of the data by the computer uh, and or the farmer can then manipulate the data. I think if the farmer wants to do that yeah. then that's nice to be able to have that capability. Some of the technologies we work with, they, they set it up very well where we can have that kind of an export. Of course, we need it for our research. Uh, and some more advanced farmers might have an interest in pulling that data. I also think that it's important in general that that there has that ability so that then you could dump that data out of um, the technology software and pull it into your dairy comp or PC dart or whatever your, your herd management software is. And by the, by the way, uh, Jeffrey, who's responsible for doing that? Is DHIA supposed to do that or De La Valle supposed to do that? The farmer, who's responsible of marrying these systems so that they will talk to each other? Or is that your job? I don't know. I think it's, it's a challenge because, uh, and I can understand why, but, but from, from a company perspective, they have their own management software, so um, they may want to keep the data within their software and, and not share data with one of the management software programs. So it, it's a challenge from, from every angle. Um, in the end, I think the farmer needs to have that in, in one place, but what's the incentive for a company to provide the data to a management software, or what's, this, what's the incentive for the management software to pull in the data from the company? Ah, now another quick question. Who owns the data? <laughs> Owner, the company, uh, DHI, ABS, who, who owns the data? That's a really another really good question. Uh, it's a legal question, of course. And uh, if we if we look at most of, of what's occurred in, in in the United States, at least, it's the user that owns the data. So, for example, my PowerPoint presentation, Microsoft doesn't own my PowerPoint presentation. I I think I do, and I, and I think most farmers would say that about the the data. They think they own the data. Uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes the companies have the feeling that that they own the data. So this is this is a legal issue that we're going to see 
come to the forefront in the next few years, and it's it's going to be a really important issue for not only dairy but agriculture as a whole. Here's our last question because it's getting late, uh, Dr. Buley. Um, it's from Dubai, and we are milking 12,500 cows where heat stress is a big challenge. What would be the best system would you recommend for us under these situations and where they're located? That's another fascinating question. At this point in time, I, I still lean toward something to measure core body temperature if we're looking at heat stress. I do think that that we have potential to pick up heat stress through things like line behavior and feeding behavior and, and, and maybe respiration rate, but I think we know the most about temperature right now, and, and that's where I would lean. I would be happy to talk to that, that person uh, afterward or send me an email or whatever also. Very good. Uh, two comments here, and we'll wrap her up, Steve. Uh, they both come from England. First, the uh, person says, thanks for another excellent webinar enjoyed here in the UK. And his other comment is that uh, lameness is second only to fertility for reasons for culling, which I think goes way back where we started the webinar saying, you know, what are what are the really important things in the future? So great comments, uh, Dr. Jeff Jeffrey Buley. And uh, Steve, we'll turn it back to you to finish up the webinar. Okay, Mike, thank you. Yeah, great questions uh, and nice comments. And we we appreciate them all. Thanks again. Thank you to Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Buley, there at the University of Kentucky. Wonderful, interesting uh, presentation. Very well done. Uh, lots of interest among our uh, participants today, obviously. And again, our thanks to Kuhn and. Uh, and a reminder to all of you to be with us if you can on January 11th for our next webinar. Dr. Mike Hutchins there at the University of Illinois. I'm going to be giving us an update on feed additives. And so we look forward to having you back with us in January. And in the meantime, we wish you all a very wonderful holiday season and a prosperous uh, new year. So that's all from Fort Atkinson today. Thanks again for your participation.